Welcome back everybody. Um, today is Sunday, so there is no Malazan content today. And today, since I'm not yet done with the thing that I wanted to talk about, I decided, luckily, <laughs> luckily I checked <laughs> Philip Chase doing the Converse sneakers book tag and found out that he tagged me. So I now can actually <laughs> do this video directly today and I'll do my longish talk on Ian McDonald's King of Morning, Queen of Day well, another day, <laughs> I guess. Um, but yes, so he tagged me in that Converse sneakers tag. It's a, an original book tag made by Christine Wallestad, or however you pronounce that. Um, it's about which books people read in their, like, as a teen or whenever, like in their formative reading years is how I would say that. So I'm going to do that today. Cheers. Now this is gonna get like a bit interesting, a bit rambly, I suspect, because I think it basically, um, I started reading twice, I think is the best way to, to explain it. Because obviously, as most of you have figured out by now, and I've mentioned here and there is like, I'm blind. I mean, I do see a bit of like light to dark and some like really strong colors and shit like that. But basically, I'm blind. But I was not always blind. So I learned reading relatively early and on like proper real books until I like and my sight was slowly degrading until the point where I couldn't read books. At least, I mean, I could still like read short things, but it was already like too difficult and so forth to read long texts because yeah too tiring i guess is the word i'm uh, looking for so and then at some point i switched to audiobooks but that was not as easy a transition as um not as easy a transition for me as it might sound like um because i know a lot of people at this point just you know um read um books and then switch to audio and back and forth and that's not exactly how that worked for me probably because you know dealing with something like being like slowly becoming blind raises a lot of like emotional stress and shit like that and you're, you're like in a way it it sort of becomes a sign that you are a bit more powerless a bit more blind when you actually switch to audiobooks so you try to you know push that as far away as possible and delay that moment for as long as possible and so forth especially if that is something that happens during your teens right it was like i don't know 16 17 ish maybe even more like yeah it's roughly like my like between like i guess 16 and 18 or 19 is where i put that um um, uh, that point where I basically struggled with the fact that I could not really read, um, but also did not really want to um, actually admit to myself that I'm I was too blind to read books. So it was like I didn't really, you know, for a time I just took more or less illegally um, acquired ebooks because at that time at that time ebooks weren't exactly a thing but you know there was like scans out there in the internet and you could put them on your computer and enlarge the font so you could still read them and shit like that and but I generally didn't read a lot during that time and then at some point I accepted it and especially with something like a company like Audible at the time I actually haven't audible.com account because at the time back back then in the olden days the german department ha didn't have that many audiobooks because for whatever reason well the reason is we in germany really hate technology especially if it's uh, digital and does not run on diesel uh, <laughs> so we um the 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 actual like um, catalog was much larger for the uh, for the English audible, audible for audible.com and, and that's um, something that I at that point decided to then use and that obviously forced me to read more in English and I've reached a point where I basically only read in English or listen in English and not even even for books that are um, translated from a different language 
so not written in English language, I also listen to in English because it's, it's come to that point where I s sort of think and read and yeah, speak almost more in English than I do in German at this point. Um, <laughs> but so that that once again was like a very formative period. So I think a, I'll go through both of those. There's a few links between those two that have like always been there that are very, very formative, but I feel that, um, yeah, um, that that second era is kind of also important in a way. But let's start with young Raf being the um, well-sheltered child of a very well-educated family, um, growing up with books relatively early. I learned to read, I don't know when I was like four, five-ish, I think around five. Like I could read before I actually entered school. Uh, not super fast and all of that, but I could already read back then. And I that brings me to like the book that I still think is the book that has had the most influence about like over me and has always is still there. It's, the book that I always claim is the best book ever written, and I'll die on that hill, and that is um, Winnie the Pooh by, and obviously also The House at Pooh Corner, with the original illustrations by, uh, like the, I don't even know who made those original illustrations, but they're quite different from what people know from the, like, Disney-fied Winnie the Pooh. Was the guy called Shepard? Maybe he was called Shepard. Anyway, so... Those original books by uh, by A. A. Milne, Milne, whatever you however you pronounce that British name, um, that book had a, has had a huge influence on me for several levels. It's like one of the f first books I could read, obviously in a German translation at the time. It was also like the first English book I read, like when I felt comfortable enough with my English skills and that I could read a simple book. That book was once again Winnie the Pooh because I. I very much connected to that book at the time, and it is has it is a book that I I mean I read that book like at least once per year, every year, and that is why I think it has like I mean, a lot of things that I enjoy in general are basically in that book already, and one thing that this book has also taught me over time is it's a book that I can. That is a book that has shown me that rereading books is really important. And reading a book again after a longer time gives you a completely different experience, for at least for some books. And I obviously read Winnie the Pooh and The House at Pooh Corner in a much different way now than I read it when I was like, I don't know, six years old. <clears throat> and I obviously, yeah. And um, then the other thing that that book already started with me that I that has stayed with me all the time is the my personal fondness for like wordplay and yeah for, for wordplay and playing with letters and words because that's a huge part of these original books. So that is definitely a thing that has stayed with me there. Also it has beginnings of fantasy in there. I mean they're just talking to animals but it's it's more a an ode to fantasy itself or to imagination in itself. And that's something that has stayed with me as well, I feel. Plus, it still makes me cry at the end every single time because it's like the ending of The House at Pooh Corner. Read, read, just read those two books at some point as an adult and you will discover so much in there. The sadness, the melancholy of growing up even like when you're talking about a kid that just starts going to school, right? The idea of how this how serious life kind of enters that magical world of childhood, that is just heartrending even now to me. And I, I'll stand by that. It's like, <laughs> this is the best book ever written. If you, if you read only one book in your entire life, it's that one. If you want to give like a child the gift of books, start them on this one. It will, it, it is just extremely well done. Plus it has that incredible chapter about racism that like is so weird, but good because it packs all that analysis in there. And it's still a chapter about um, fluffy animals. Maybe I'll do, maybe I'll do like an, an individual video on Winnie the Pooh 
one point or another. We'll see. I, I still feel it's it's a magical book and everyone should read it. And it definitely has stayed with me for, I don't know, almost 30 years, like 30 years at this point, right? So that's, that's crazy. Um, so that's definitely like one book that has influenced my reading immensely. The next thing then is that when I went, started going to school, um, at least for the first, like, I don't know how many years, eight years, nine years, eight years, I feel. Yeah, I think it was eight. I'm not good with numbers and shit. Um, <laughs> which is why I studied math for a while, because there are no numbers in maths. Anyway, um, so uh, <laughs> I went to a Rudolf Steiner Waldorf school. And there's that has definitely influenced me as a person in a lot of ways and had a, has had a huge impact on me as a person. I am not a proponent of that type of philosophy or like um, way of living, way of thinking, not even a real proponent of that way of education. But I have certainly profited from it in a lot of ways because you get taught a lot of mythology in those schools and... I did my, my own reading at this on the side at that point. And that's, I guess, where like in, I don't know, first, second, third grade, there's like my love for both like German, like more like fairy tales, folk tales, obviously super sanitized for kids at that point, but you know, and then like classical, like Norse and Greek mythology was kindled. And I remember reading stuff like that for a while and the, you know there's like these like late like mid 19th century mythology collection books in like in the english language it's probably going to be bullfinch or something like that in german the equivalent would be um gustav schwab the um legends of classical antiquity that definitely is like the Thing that like for a long time like everyone had one of those books in their home like at least if they're like from the more like higher higher education classes not even everyone did read that but it's like one of those things that was like in a lot of old bookshelves and i raided my mother's bookshelves a lot so uh, <laughs> i grew up with that those books for a while and read a lot of like non-fiction also and i remember like the first thing there I don't know even how old I was for that. Probably 12, 13. That's when I discovered there was like, um, also on my mother's bookshelf, which is basically what has started me reading is my mother's bookshelf. Because there's like, there was an edition of The Lord of the Rings and The Silmarillion and The Hobbit in there, for example. <clears throat> and I, I I was aware of that book from a very young age, but it took me until, I don't know, 12 or 13 when I first read it. I guess 12 or 13, maybe 11, something like that. Um, and at the same time, due to like the, the ideas of like reading like sort of children's or young, like YA nonfiction on history, like, you know, books on pirates, knights, um, what have you, that kind of thing. I also discovered a row of these um, uh, very cheap um like books of like classics books they're like sort of the german equivalent of like your penguin classics like super cheap thin paper and you get like all your like old historians and like um legends and poets and shit like that you get your odyssey your iliad you get your like classic philosophers in that and i remember stumbling i i don't even know how i so that was when i go Book that I actually bought from my like pocket money back then, uh, being the weird kid that I was, <laughs> um, like I stumbled on an old copy of the, like the Gallic Wars, Caesar's Gallic Wars at the time, in that like it, th those my that was either my mother's book or my father's I don't know that he left when they like split up, um, I don't know whose it was but i definitely found a copy of caesar's gallic wars and then i decided and i don't even know what the trigger was but it's definitely a book that has had a huge impact on me over time and that was herodotus um histories of the um persian wars and the sheer like power of herodotus on 
and as I said, that's like one of the first books that I actually bought from my, like grown up books that I bought from my pocket money when I was like 12 or 13. I felt super, I don't know <laughs> what at the time it was. I mean, <laughs> I, I was a weird kid. I was listening to like really bad punk rock and listening Her and reading Herodotus at the time. Um, but anyway, so Herodotus histories has had a huge impact on me and always like, I think been the one thing that has driven like my mu music taste as well as my book taste in a way that I usually try to go to those sources. It's like, I read a book, I kind of like it. I want to find out what's, what's the influences that the, like those, that piece of arts influences are both with music and with books. It's like, I read a book, I want to find out what that, what the author read or was inspired by. So I go back and read that and go back and go back and go back on that eternal search for whatever started it. And to look at these classical sources, like as directly as possible. I mean, I can, you know, go back in time and hear, whoever was later turned into Homer, like, recite the Iliad and the Odyssey. I could not do that. Um, <clears throat> but, um, yeah. So, um, uh, Herodotus Histories was, like, my first encounter with an actual, like, grown-up version of um, a piece of classical literature, in a way. Non-fiction, well, it's pretty fictional in parts, but, you know, of that kind of thing. And that has also stayed with me up to this day. And I've read a ton of these classic, I, yeah, yeah, I don't want to, you know, sound arrogant or anything, but I've read a ton of these things like Herodotus, Thucydides, um, Xenophon, those people um, over time. And so I feel, yes, that was one of those other things. Same as like my general at that time, my general idea of, um, and this is definitely also something that I need to, like, have my parents to thank for, for whatever reason, there existed back at that point, a lot of, like, um, abridged, simplified versions of classics of, like, your serious literature classics in a way abridged for kids or like young adults and I read a lot of those and then obviously later on I went back and realized that a a young adult version of Moby Dick is not the same as reading the actual thing in English which you should actually do because Moby Dick is one of the most fascinating like darkly fascinating books I've read and does once again a lot of these like things it's it's like Cervantes and Don Quixote is one of those books that was definitely ahead of the curve, like ahead of its time, does a lot of very modern things. And once again, so my my appreciation for actual classic classics of literature was, I guess, awakened by these abbreviated, simplified kids' versions of these books, in a way. And then obviously there was Lord of the Rings, and I need to talk about Lord of the Rings because that's probably, I feel like the... So the last, the last printed book that I was able to read and like as a book, still in German at the time, was The Silmarillion. And I was 15 at the time. I mean, yes, I read like shorter books and stuff like that afterwards, but like the last like, or like with like enlarged print and stuff like that, but usually shorter stuff. But the last book I read like from an actual book bought like copy like actual trade you now paperback it was actually a hardcover but you know that kind of mass market book that i read was the silmarillion that obviously has had a huge impact on me i definitely read actually i read the lord of the rings first and the hobbits after that for whatever reason but once again my mother's bookshelf there because she has had she had those People from Germany probably know those, um, this like old German hardcover edition of Lord of the Rings. It has a very, it has very, um, easily identifiable, um, um, how to say, um, book covers, right? It has these, um, the cover design, the cover illustrations are weirdly abstract, 
they look like a mix of like um like church window stained glass windows and like abstract art they're like very unique for that time they've been like the, the covers for like the that german translation from like the 1970s to like 1990s or something until they decided to retranslate and redo like repackage it and whatnot around the time when the movies came out but those books they were on that bookshelf from as like forever so i remember being fascinated by these books by the covers and wanted to read them for like a long time and like when i was like i don't know how old and my mother was at the time like always telling me that i should wait a bit longer because it's a rather thick book a bit complicated for i don't know a 10 year old to grasp and uh, uh, so actually being allowed as a kid to actually take those books from that shelf and read them was something of like, I don't want to say a rite of passage, but it definitely was something where it felt like a more, um, I don't want to say old, but a more adult person in a way, which obviously is bullshit because I was like 12 or 13 or whatever. And yeah, I, I, I like... These are books that I vividly remember reading, right? Um, that I, I remember I was on, we were on like a summer vacation and yeah, on a summer vacation on a farm somewhere in Northern Germany doing like long riding, daily riding trips because I, at the time I did a lot of horse riding as well. And I remember like, you know, reading Lord of the Rings at the last, yeah, the Return of the King at the time at that um, during those sum during that summer holiday and that that those things have obviously stayed with me now have kindled not only I guess not only like a love for fantasy but also the from the from the beginning that like fantasy is a genre for grown up people in a way that there is fantasy for grown up people because it, those were my mother's books that I like took from there from the shelf and read and the awareness that fantasy is something that people read that are not that it's not just children's stories and that that was definitely drilled into me with lord of the rings because it was not something that i picked up by myself but something that i found on my mother's bookshelf so yes that i feel kind of is like where I started reading books, like actual printed books. And then, yeah, from like roughly around 15, 16 until 18, 19, maybe 20, I didn't read a whole lot because of, um, yes, struggling with the fact that I could no longer just pick up a book and read it and kind of not wanting to admit to myself that I was as um, handicapped as I was. Um, which is something that I still struggle with <laughs> uh, to this day, but I, at least I've made my peace with like the reading stuff. And then, yes, I at some point I caved in and I got myself this Audible account and then I just um, read a whole ton. I mean, I can now, you know, go back and look at the first books that I picked up um, like that, that I bought with my first Audible credits. I think the, the, the actual first one I ever bought was either Chasm City by Alistair Reynolds or um, Perdido Street Station by China Mieville. Um, I think that's either one, either the one or the other is the first audiobook I ever bought and I got on Audible for a credit and... That was because of a friend, like my flatmate at the time, had just read both of those and was raving about them. And then I also wanted to read those. And, you know, so my flatmate, when I started university and we were playing Dungeons and Dragons together and other pen and paper role playing games, I, I obviously read like stuff in between those like two distinct periods. But I feel that there's a difference there. I mean, I discovered Conan the Barbarian much before, like, going into audible audiobooks. I know that. And Conan has obviously had a huge impact on me for, like, ever. Same as, to a lesser degree, Murkock and, and Liber, but I, I... 
Yeah. I remember that those things. And so, yes, that um, definitely was like the start. And with those Audible credits, I relatively early started uh, also getting into Discworld. I, I was aware of Discworld before, but then I just like st got stuck into that Discworld black hole, I guess, in a way. And that has probably been like after Winnie the Pooh, the most influential book in my entire life is probably Discworld because... I've, I'll just take this world as a whole book there because it has, it has all these things that I want. It's, it's it makes fun of a lot of other things. It's full of like these references where I can feel clever when I actually discover them. It's like the same thing that I like uh, with Umberto Eco and um, with uh, Thomas Pynchon and so forth. It has a lot of really bad jokes and wordplay in there, and it is also just written well. Those things have. I, I probably learned a lot of that through and learned to appreciate a lot of that through Terry Pratchett and I, that has stayed with me until today, I guess. And I guess last, but not least, like a book, and that was relatively late in life. Like, um, like the book that has had also like, like shifted my like perspective on literature in a way or in reading in general was um blood meridian by cormac mccarthy because like you know i'm i'm a contrarian bastard it's like at some point like everyone and their dog in the like nerdier side of culture pop culture was totally amazed by cormac mccarthy's the road and they're like yeah this is the darkest book i've ever read it's so amazing everyone like literally everyone and that dog was reading it and raving about it it's like once people that i know read almost no books start telling me i should read a certain book i go like no fuck you i will not pick up that book and while I have picked up the road at some point, there's a few other things that I have never picked up that people from time to time, like non-readers read. But I, I've picked up the road at some point. I read it. It's a good book. But instead, I picked, instead of the road at that time, I picked up Blood Meridian. And oh boy, has that book shown me how dark stories can get. How brutally dark, grim, and just like, yeah, how brutal books can get, how brutal stories can get without actually, you know, being too much in the gratuitous violence. I mean, there's gratuitous violence in that book, don't get me wrong, but it just... I don't know, the sheer bleakness of all of it and how you can, like, have that bleakness in the story and in the language. And this just, I don't know, has has stuck with me and has haunted me ever since. And I've reread it a bunch of times and it, it still haunts me. It's a, I guess that is sort of the list. I mean, I read a shit ton of books in between, both classics and a lot of fantasy. I obviously went through my J.R. George R. R. Martin phase. I never went through a Harry Potter phase because when that was big, I had just started reading The Silmarillion and um, little kids waving around their wands did not hold a candle to... Um, thousands of elves slaughtering each other so i stayed with the elves and slaughtering because at that point I, I had also like fully come from my punk rock phase into my heavy metal phase and more traditional power metal whatever bands there's a lot of tolkien influence in there so it just like went that way for a long time and yeah i've, I've always stayed with that it's like i like world wordplay I like books that um, deal with the question of mythology, of imagination, and of fantasy as a subject matter and not just as a genre. I do like to look, uh, try to find influences in or like the original sources of stuff. That's still what I do. And basically, how I continue reading is like you tell me something's a classic, I will probably go and pick it up rather sooner than later. And yeah. That's that's how I that's how I roll. So yeah, that turned out to be more rambly and longer than I thought. Um, I'll link the original um, tag by a video and the response from uh, Christine down below in the 
what's it called a uh, description box i don't know who else to tag because i think everyone i know has already been tagged <laughs> see i'm usually last with these kind of tag things and stuff like that so i don't know who else to tag because i feel everyone i know has been tagged anyway i hope you enjoyed this and i'll talk to you tomorrow um probably about bone hunters i guess all right until then cheers